Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Pastor David. Pastor Mark will be back next week. I'm going to jump right into this today. We are talking about lost, found, and seeking. There was a riot recently in New York City, Union Square. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. People were arrested, including the, the main person that organized this whole event. He was a Twitch streamer. His first name is Kai. I believe you pronounce his last name as Senate, C-E-N-A-T. And uh, he decided, he's, he's a Twitch streamer, and he decided to say, uh, hey, meet me at Union Square on this particular day. I'm going to give out PlayStation 5s. I want to thank all my fans. And so before anyone knew what was going on, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of youth, of kids, uh, just filling up Union Square. And some people, for some reason, brought some M80s, so there were fireworks involved. Uh, there was, the police were called, they were blocking traffic, there was damage to cars and property. It turned into a riot, and Kai was arrested for inciting a riot as a Twitch streamer. And again, maybe you've heard about it. It was, it was crazy, it was sad, um, a little strange. That's not what caught my eye when I looked up, because I'd never heard of Kai before. I don't really watch Twitch. Uh, usually he does videos. He's a gamer, so he's playing a game on video. He's reacting to other videos, so he has an audience. They pay to watch him do things. What caught my eye is I found out that Kai Senate makes upwards more than $20,000 in his sleep. He doesn't make money. It's not like he has an investment that's earning dividends even while he's asleep. He keeps himself broadcasting all throughout the day and all throughout the night. So... Every night when he's asleep, he's, he's uh, broadcasting it, and people are paying to watch him sleep. This dude makes more than or about $250,000 a year just from sleeping and people watching him sleep. Okay? Uh, so I, I saw that, and I thought, that's weird. I mean, call me an old guy. That was strange. That was weird to me. Not only is someone watching someone else sleep who they don't know, who does not know them, but they're paying money to watch them sleep. I don't know how, what kind of interaction you can do with your, with your uh, person you watch on Twitch while they're sleeping. But for someone to get $20,000 a month to film themselves, I, just, I don't see any rationalization for that. Unless you're a parent and you're watching your kid who's like a baby, you know? You could tell me, you could rationalize, I only watched for five minutes. That's, that's five minutes too long. That's, if it's not your child and they're not a baby, it's creepy. Very strange to me. <laughs> Okay. Interesting though. That, that came out. I was like, wow, didn't even know this. This is a whole thing on Twitch. They have a whole section. I'm just sleeping. And you are subscribed to that person. You're paying money and you watch them sleep. I guess you talk to other people and you're saying, I don't know. I'm not sure how it works. Again, call me the old guy, but it was weird. I'll go a little farther in this because I had a thought when I watched this. Um, let's go back a little bit in time. Michael Jackson had a final concert before he died. The show never happened because he died before the show happened, but they made a movie called This Is It. And that was based on, I don't remember if he called it that, the, the um, concert, but they interviewed him and he started saying, this is it. That was Michael Jackson's phrase as he was promoting this concert. This is it. Basically, he was saying, this is the last concert I'm going to give ever. I mean, until he needs money again, probably. But once he died and this didn't happen, uh, they showed this film. And one of the people they interviewed was one of the dancers who got a role in this, uh, in this concert. And they asked him, what did this mean to you, getting to dance for Michael Jackson? He's crying, and he says, he says this, in his tears, through his tears. Life is tough, right? And he said, I've been looking for a reason to continue, and this is it. So his this is it was different. His this is it was dancing for Michael Jackson became his reason for living. I uh, just want you to know, in case you don't, Dancing for Michael Jackson is a very unstable reason to continue living. So I watch something like that, and I watch something like people are paying money every month to watch somebody sleep. And here's the word that comes into my mind. Wow, they're lost. They're lost. People are lost so completely. I don't even say this judgmentally. It's just my initial gut reaction. Lost so completely without mooring, without an anchor, that they're grabbing onto anything that makes them feel connected, makes them feel potentially secure, attached to something lost, completely lost. I'm not talking about the TV show that came out in the early 2000s that, you know, as you watched it, they didn't actually ever end the series, asked a lot of questions, never gave us answers. They were, turned out they were lost as they were filming this silly show. I'm not saying I'm lost with, like, with my career. I have other things figured out, but I'm not sure what I'm gonna do for a living. I'm not saying lost in relationships. A lot of people might talk about that. I'm not even necessarily saying spiritually lost, although that's encompassed in this whole idea. I mean, I think there are people, most of whom might admit it, that feel completely lost. I have no idea what to do. 
about anything. But I think when we're, when we're confronted with this, with this kind of thing, this kind of extreme uh, acting out of someone feeling lost, we have a, a few reactions we can do. One of them is disgust. I can't believe you're paying money to watch some random person sleep. I'm disgusted by you. I can't believe you're saying that dancing for Michael Jackson is your reason for living. And so we just, we, we respond to revulsion. We could respond in indifference. So, all right, just, you know what? They're weird. Let them do what they're going to do. Not necessarily untrue, but I think we have to watch what's going on in our heart when we're saying that about other people. Because there's a third reaction that I think God does when he's confronted with people who are lost. Here's the motivation. There's a motivation, there's, then there's an action. Because the third thing we can do if we see someone who is lost is we can have compassion. And I believe that God looks at everyone who we may have tried to write off and he says, nope, those are the kind of people that I want to save and I can save and I'm seeking after them. So I'm just going to give you an example of that. Mark chapter 6. Uh, Jesus is tired. He's been ministering all day. He wants to go to a place where he's all alone. So they take off on a ship. The crowd knows where he's going. So they follow him. It says that Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they were lost. In Luke 15, it says that the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered. They said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus responds to that. He, he, he kind of turns it back on them. He says, wouldn't you want to find something that was of value that you lost? Wouldn't you try to find it? If you had a hundred sheep and one of them left, wouldn't you leave the 99 and go find the lost sheep and bring it back home? Wouldn't you, he said, if you had, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. If you had five coins, each of them worth, they're rare coins, they're each worth $100,000 and you lost one of them, would you just be like, oh, well, at least I still have $400,000 left. No, you would, you would tear apart your home to find this coin of value and you'd be really, really excited once you found it. Then he goes even more personally, he says, what if it's your child that's lost? And he tells a story that we have come to call the prodigal son. And he says, I, Jesus gets, God gets special joy out of finding something, restoring something that was lost and finding it again. He gets a, a special excitement about that. That's what God does. What God does when we're lost is he has compassion on us. Remember the title of this is lost, found, and seeking. When we are lost, God seeks after us. There's a very famous statement that Jesus says in, in Luke 19. He's talking to someone named Zacchaeus. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. And then he said, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. I was always confused by this, this scripture. Jesus is challenged again. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who don't like him, he's talking about what he's doing. And they say, okay, if you are who you say you are, show us a sign. And Jesus always tells it like it is. So he says back to them, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. I'm always stuck at that. He called them a wicked and adulterous generation. My question, then what was he doing there? Jesus, weren't there less wicked, less adulterous generations that you could have gone to? Weren't there people more deserving of who you are and what you brought and the good news and the freedom that you bring? Aren't there people that are less wicked? Aren't there people that are less stuck in that? And as I think through that, I realize that's, that is the whole point of Jesus. That's what God does. He seeks after you when you're wicked and when you're adulterous. Paul makes it personal. He's talking to Timothy and he says this, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he says, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, and many of us have felt that way before, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. I love that. I love how personal it is for, for Paul. I love how excited he is about God's incredible patience that he had with him. Because when you start thinking about it, oh, that's how God responded to me when I was lost. So we have a song that's been popular for centuries called Amazing Grace. And there's a phrase in there we get straight from the Bible. I, two of them. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Because God actively sought out you and me and brought us back into the fold. We have moved from the category of lost to found. So here's the problem. So you might know that. You might know that here. You might even know that here. You've gone through that sense of, I was searching, I was seeking, I had no idea what to do. And God found me and brought me to an actual place of fulfillment and stability and joy and peace and all that kind of stuff. Then how come 
why, if I'm already found, why do I still sometimes have that lost feeling? Uh, maybe it's less about being lost and more about being confused. My wife tells me that I, I text her that a lot. I'm so confused. I'll tell you why. Because my wife has a habit of changing subjects mid-conversation without telling me that she has changed the subject. So for example, I might say, how was your day? And she'll say, well, I did this. I had this meeting. And then she'll say, girdle. And I'll say, Gird girdle, what you talking about? She'll say, girdle, football girdle. Football, yes, you got to pay $50. Isaiah's football girdle. Okay, I didn't know that football players wore girdles, nor did I know I was supposed to buy one, nor did I know we had changed subjects to football from how your day was going. She said, oh, sorry, I changed the subject. I just forgot to tell you. So, okay. So she carries that habit on through text. So I'll be texting her, hey, did you get a chance to call the auto insurance company? And she'll say, yep, I texted them. And then she'll say, grilled chicken. And apparently she switched to what she would like for dinner tonight. She'd like me to pick up some chicken. Can we have grilled chicken for dinner? And I'll say, when I just get grilled chicken to my auto insurance question, I'll say, I'm so confused. Here's what's worse. Sometimes I'm on a text thread with my wife and my daughter, and they will have gone through five separate conversations. Somehow they can track each other. And they've gone through five separate conversations where I thought we were still way up here on this conversation. I'm on this track and they've jumped five times before. Somehow they're still tracking. And, I, and I, then I'll text her, I am so confused. And there's all this, I just need a little context. I need some, a preface. We are switching from the, all they have to say is speaking of this, and then they've moved me to the other track. It'd be very nice of them to do that. You ever felt that way? You ever felt that way at church? You're like, okay, I feel like they're tracking. I feel like these people are tracking. I feel like they're talking about this, this, and this. I should be able to follow, but I am really confused. Maybe you feel embarrassed by that. You're like, well, I've, I'm supposed to be found. I was lost, and now I'm found. And so we have this pressure like, okay, I can't, I can't be lost anymore. I can't be confused. So you smile and you nod. It's like someone's speaking a different language. You're just smiling and nodding and hope they don't catch on that you're not speaking, that you don't understand everything that they're saying. Sometimes that means when you start going through things again and you feel more confused and you start feeling a little bit more of that lost feeling, you're like, well, now I can't go to church anymore because I have to have everything together. I'm supposed to be found. Well, I want you to know you don't have to be found again. Okay? You did not get re-lost. Sometimes we feel that way. Maybe I was re-lost. Here's what you have to remember. We need to take into account God's next step once we are found. Back in the day, I was uh, uh, sixth, seventh, I think it was seventh and eighth grade. I decided to play basketball. Why did I decide to play basketball at school? Not because I was good at it. I've never been good at any sport. Coaches would approach me and they'd be really excited that I was very tall. And they'd always say all the time, hey, you should play basketball. And I'd say, I don't know how to play basketball. It's fine, you're tall. Uh, you're a big guy. We just want you on the team. You just have to stand there and not do anything. It's the biggest lie coaches ever tell you and they just want you for your size. So I, why not? I should work out. I'll, I'll join basketball. It was, uh, it was extremely embarrassing. It's still embarrassing to this day. You want to think about it. This is early nineties. Uh, I just missed it. I've, I've been so angry. I just missed, you know, Michael Jordan started playing and he made it cool to wear really long shorts when you play basketball. So this was like 1991. In the 90s, your shorts, when you played athletics, were like, it was like a mini skirt. Okay. So my shorts are way up here and I'm, you know, I'm dark hair. I'm brown up here. My thighs don't get sun. They're as white as boiled rice. So it was embarrassing just putting on this weird outfit and going out there. And to make matters worse, I was a horrible basketball player. I was terrible. So there was one guy on the team who was both good and would talk to me. See, when you're not good, that's the whole thing. So there was one guy who was nice enough to still talk to me, even though I was horrible. So my parents said, hey, why don't you ask Ian uh, to help you learn how to play basketball? So I said, okay. So during the summer, I said, hey, Ian, can you show me some, show me how to play this game that I signed up to do? So he did. Uh, about once a week, we'd get together. We'd play basketball. He taught me how to shoot. He taught me how to dribble. He taught me all these different things. Uh, and I got... I got better. I remember the very first game of the next season, I still had to wear those silly, super high shorts. I'll never forget those, traumatizing for me. But I remember playing the game, and I remember I could actually understand a little bit more than I used to understand. And we we're playing this other team. They weren't a great team, but they, uh, they had a play. I guess they had a certain number of plays. And so the guy had the ball, and he put up like a two. So they're, gonna, they're gonna do play two. And I was like, oh, I remember. I remember that from earlier in the game. And I saw them get into the same formation. So. I started running right when the guy passed, uh, tossed the ball. And I ran up and I knew who it was going to pass to. So I jumped up in the air and I grabbed the ball in the air. I don't think it's called interception in basketball, but that's basically what I did. So I got it and I dribbled forward and everyone's cheering, yay. And I'm, and I'm dribbling over and I jumped up and I, and I shot the ball. 
And uh, then I got hit, right? Right after I, sh I shot it, someone hit me and I slammed into the padding on the side. So I got fouled, didn't even know if I made it. And I realized the ball jumped right in that little back, back thingy. What's it called? Backboard. And it hit that and it, and it went in the basket. So I scored a point, I stole the ball. I scored a point, everyone was cheering. Yeah, all the girls, David, we loved you this whole time. We just never told you. That part might've been in my imagination, but they were all excited. Everyone was cheering. I was happy. I got fouled and I made a goal and I stole the ball. I was like, vindication, baby. And I think I missed the two free throws, but still, it was a really good play. So I remember right after that, it was like the next day at school, two of the guys who used to pick on me all the time, one of them said, oh, how was Ortega? Is he horrible like he normally is? And the other guy who used to pick on me all the time, he said, he didn't call me Ortega. He said, are you kidding me? Dave was one of the best players on the team. It wasn't true, but I, I didn't correct him. I was like, and he said, he told him about the play and he said, I turned around for like a second. Then I realized David had the ball. I was like, yeah. So what happened? I got better. I wasn't great. I'm still not great. Please don't challenge me to a game of one-on-one. -on -one. You will be disappointed. But I did get better because I applied myself to it and I learned. See, the goal that God has once you've moved from lost to found, God has a goal for you. And that's that you mature. That's that you grow in Him. And in order to do that, He flips the script on us a little bit. See, when you were lost, God sought you out, brought you from knowing nothing, brought you back into His fold. You were lost. Now you're found. Now it's your turn. God has sought you, and our next challenge is to learn how we seek God. Psalm 63, verse 1. David's praying. He says, God, you are my God. You are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. Psalm 105. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. God himself becomes our goal. He's already sought us. He's already brought himself down to us and picked us up out of the muck and the mire of our own sin and our own devastation and the consequence of the things we have done. And he's brought us to a place and he set our feet on firm ground and we were lost and now we are found and we can sing that song with conviction. And now our job is just to get to know him better, to seek his face in every circumstance and in every situation. To seek means that we have a goal. If we're going to seek financial success, if we're going to seek friendship, if we seek favor, we seek an audience with someone, God just changes it. He says, I want you to seek me. I want you to seek my kingdom, my righteousness, my wisdom, my presence, my favor, my will. And that constant learning how to actively seek God's face leads to our growth. I watched a, a video of a rescue mission. It was a specialized rescue mission. There was a young kid, I think he was seven years old or something. He was separated from his family. So he's deep in the woods. No one knows where he's at. Okay. They've sent, they've sent search teams out. They can't find him. So they called the specialized team and they have specialized trained units that are out there searching in the grid in the deep dark of the forest. This particular night, it was overcast. So the stars weren't shining. The moon was in new moon phase. So there was no moonlight. It was pitch black. So this team goes out. They have people on the ground. All of them have night vision goggles. And then there's an overwatch helicopter. The overwatch helicopter has an infrared camera. You can't give infrared to the people on the ground because trees don't give off a heat signature. So you'd run into a tree if all you saw was infrared. So they put on the night goggles so they can see. All of a sudden things are brighter. So they can look clearly for this young kid who has neither of these. But the biggest part of this rescue, and it's amazing to watch, and it's heartwarming to watch, and it's impressive to watch, so Overwatch is looking there and he can see, he says, okay, I see, you can see all of them. All of them are giving off the heat signatures. He says, okay, you see the small little signature over here. He said, okay, I think that's him. He's not, he's moving like a human. He's not moving like a deer or another animal, another creature. He says, okay, he's about, God, he's about three clicks away from you. Just turn this way. You'll get him. They say, where? I can't, I can't quite see. He said, I'll, I'll shine a light in that area. And you see them get there and then you can hear it on the radio. They say, okay, we got him. He looks okay. He's doing okay. We have him. It's this beautiful rescue. And you're so excited. And you think as a parent, how excited they must be. And you think as a lost kid, how excited he must be to have found the help that he needed. So before Jesus, you're the kid. You have no way to know where you're going. You don't know where you are. You can't see anything. It's actually, he's even less lost than we feel because he knows he has firm ground on his feet. He knows he can feel around and touch something even if he can't see it. But he has no way to find his bearings. Once you are found, God gives you two things. He gives you night vision goggles. So you couldn't see before. You couldn't navigate your surroundings. God gives you a light in his word to navigate a new path. He gives you the way to see around you. He gives you light in the darkness. You can see this is a danger. This is something I need to go toward. 
but you're still the one doing the navigating. The other thing it gives you is a walkie talkie. And he says, you have direct access to Overwatch. Imagine if when you're found and you receive both these things, you never put those glasses on and you never turned on the walkie talkie. Hey, Overwatch, I'm not quite sure where I'm at right now. Could you tell me which direction to turn? Hey, Overwatch, I'm not quite sure how far I am away from the goal. Could you give me just a, could you just, just give me the next turn? Hey, Overwatch, I can see there's a big tree over there. Is there a cliff? Because I won't be able to see that if I'm walking. We have to use what God has given us. The walkie-talkie is our connection to God himself. Hey, Overwatch, hey, God, I'm overwhelmed. Could you please help me from the position that you stand, which is higher than I am? Ephesians 1 says this, Paul's talking to the church. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know him better. That's it, church. You don't necessarily get a full plan, but you get access to the very source of life, promise, and fulfillment, and direction. You get direct, special access and you get a sight where before you were blind, now you can see and you can start navigating, but you have to actively seek him because it's your turn. So I speak to, I'm going to speak to both groups here. If you are lost, I want you to know there is an answer to that feeling of being lost. There is an actual place where you can be found. And I don't say that arrogantly, and I don't say it condescendingly. I don't say it in any way that might turn you off. I'm saying it very, very sincerely. There is an answer in Jesus where you can, you will be able to say, I was blind, I couldn't see, and now I can. I was dead, and now I'm alive. I was lost, and now I'm found. And you just have to turn your life over to the actual ruler of the universe and give him lordship of your life and, st- and acknowledge his lordship and stop trying to live it on your own and confess your sin. But if you're already found, you have to hear this. It is okay to sometimes still feel lost. That doesn't mean you run away from God. It doesn't mean it, it hasn't worked. You don't need to pretend like you have everything figured out and, and as, if, as if God has taken away all your trouble. No, you just need to turn on the walkie-talkie and put on those night goggle visions and read His Word and get His direction, His principles, His kingdom, His righteousness, His presence, and learn how to seek Him for every single, every single thing. You understand He can help you with every single thing in which you need direction. If you're asking about finances, if you're asking about personal relationships, if you're asking about parenting advice, if you're asking about where you're supposed to move, all of these kinds of things, he says, you have direct access to me. Seek his face about every situation. You were lost. He sought you. You are now found. It's time for you to learn how to seek his face. None of this is bad. None of this is a chore. In fact, that special direct access that I have to the God of the entire universe is not just my privilege. It is my desire and my delight. I get to turn it on anytime I want and ask him and seek his face. And his promise is that if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. He does not leave you without recourse. Amen? Lost, found, still seeking. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your care in our life. I thank you so much for your direction that you have given us direct access to you. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord God. Thank you for creating a clear path for us to move forward. Father, I pray that everyone who feels guilty about feeling a little bit confused sometimes, you just remind them this is all part of the process. You are helping them mature and you are helping them grow. We ask for your blessing and your favor on every single person who's watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in today. We'll see you next week.